Well, it's tough for an MIT graduate who comes off as kind of a master of the universe type to argue that he's an idiot. He's testifying before Congress. This week on Coinage, we explore the initial defense from SBF, provided by SBF and dissected by the prosecutor who took down Bernie Madoff. In reading SBF's defense, one thing becomes immediately clear. His defense's strategy hinges in large part on what former Alameda Research's CEO Caroline Ellison's role was in FTX's collapse. Keep in mind, Caroline Ellison has already pled guilty to fraud charges and is cooperating as a key witness for the government in its case against Sam Bankman-Fried. She pled guilty last December to seven counts relating to fraud and money laundering, and in her statement to the court, admitted to borrowing money from FTX in order to repay Alameda's loans. She claimed she worked with SBF to retain Alameda's lenders by giving them, quote, materially misleading financial statements and lending Alameda's money directly to FTX execs, including SBF himself. But SBF, as outlined in the defense documents Coinage has reviewed, seems to be hoping everyone can agree on just one more point of order. Caroline's guilt proves Sam's innocence, given that FTX's collapse stemmed from Alameda's. Arguably, SBF is implementing that strategy before the trial even starts, landing him in hot water and getting slapped with a gag order for leaking personal excerpts from Caroline Ellison's diary to the New York Times. The Times has since filed a motion to support SBF's right to continue speaking to the press. And if he can, Coinage has already started sourcing our community's questions for an interview at coinage.media. And look, I'm not a lawyer, so we brought in Mark Litt, one of the lead prosecutors in the government's case against Bernie Madoff, to unpack what we've uncovered. Well, first of all, I don't know if his leaking of the diaries was part of a defense strategy or a personal strategy. Second, um, sort of punching down at somebody is not necessarily a good look uh, when you're in front of a jury, particularly if that person happens to be, from what I've seen, a rather diminutive looking, nice young woman who you know, used to be in love with. And on top of that, you've got the prosecution who could just take that and say, well, you put her there for a reason. You knew her better than anybody. Why would you do that? Why would you put somebody who was not prepared to fill that role? Oh, I know why. Maybe it was because you thought you could control them. You were one of the former lead prosecutors on the Bernie Madoff case, one of the biggest Ponzi schemes, if not the largest Ponzi scheme in American history. When you look at that case and compare it and contrast it with what's being alleged that Sam Bankman-Fried did between Alameda and FTX, what do you see? Well, it's not clear to me that this is a, exactly a Ponzi scheme, but um, you know, securities fraud is securities fraud. Lying to an investor about what you're going to do with their money, not every um, loss of an investor's funds is criminal. Not every failure of a business is criminal. If you have a pattern of activity that includes lying to auditors, changing the name of the entity in which accounts are, are titled uh, to avoid regulatory scrutiny or due diligence by banks, yeah. uh, if you intermingle and commingle funds and use money from one pocket to pay off the debts of another pocket, when you lie to investors about what the relationship of entities are to solicit funds or investments, uh, you, you know you start adding all those things up uh, along the way, and it becomes a more uh, criminal-sounding case. When you look at, I guess, carelessness versus a criminal intent in this case, as you noted, very different than a Ponzi scheme. How does that factor in? That's the key of any, any white collar case is about knowledge and intent. Like I said earlier, the facts, you could almost stipulate to them. What happened is in the records. Yeah. What somebody knew and intended and whether they had criminal intent isn't on a piece of paper. Juries can um, glean it, uh, infer it from the evidence. Uh -huh and the testimony, including of co-conspirators. 
Sam, at one point in an interview, talked about setting up bank accounts for FTX in the name of Alameda Research. Especially in 2017, if you named your company like, we do cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, arbitrage, multinational stuff, no one's going to give you a bank account if that's your company name. Among other things, a terrible company name. But, but also, they're, they're just going to be like, oh, geez. Yeah, no, we've been warned about companies with this name. Like, we're, <laughs> you know, you're going to have to go through the enhanced process. And I don't want to bother with that right now. It's almost lunchtime. <laughs> so, um, but everyone wants to serve a research institute. Well, it's a powerful admission. It's an admission of, of bank fraud, knowing that he wouldn't have been able to open the bank accounts if he was accurate and honest about what was going on. I don't know if the evidence relating to that will come in to this trial or not. If and when it does, it will be, uh, I think I'm willing to predict the government will be playing the clip too. Let me ask you this. It's a pejorative term, but I'm curious to get your take on it as a defense attorney. The idiot defense, so-called, for clients that say, look, it wasn't my fault. I didn't understand what was going on here. Uh, I'm not a criminal just because the thing failed. Like, the line between failure versus fraud is something we've discussed on this show before. Mm -hmm. Particularly in the realm of cryptocurrency, it seems to be a rather convenient out for a lot of people who are caught up in these problems. When you look at, I guess, carelessness versus a criminal intent in this case, how does that factor in? Well, it's tough for an MIT graduate who comes off as kind of a master of the universe type to argue that he's an idiot, that he didn't know. He's testifying before Congress. He's raising billions of dollars. He's created a platform where there's trading of a billion or 10 billion a day or, or whatever. Yeah. Um, I don't know, doesn't sound like an idiot to me. So the idiot defense is tough. The idiot defense is tough. What is the key element of that defense when you're trying to say, look, my client didn't actually know what was going on because it wasn't represented correctly to him. So he wasn't a conspirator in this. It was that he put people in positions to run things and they did not run it correctly. Well, the government has a lot of evidence, seemingly at least by what's in the indictment, to the contrary. Um, whether it's changing the names of entities to distance them from Alameda, whether it's um, defrauding auditors so that the financial statements don't accurately reflect the financial position of the company, whether it's uh, telling investors in FTX um, what the relationship between FTX and Alameda is when that's not so. And all of those things, as I read the indictment, are not just um, based on documents, but they're going to be based on, as I said earlier, more than one person is going to corroborate that. This, for all intents and purposes, is perhaps the make or break moment for SBF's defense. Because, as he tells it, there was in fact one element in FTX's collapse that he was unaware of. And he further claims neither Caroline, nor his co-founder, nor his head of engineering brought it to his attention. That is, the size of Alameda's liabilities and FTX's exposure to it were both incorrectly tracked and kept secret from him, he says. For starters, it's been well documented just how messy Alameda's banking relationship was with FTX. In John Ray's latest report into dissecting FTX's banking structures, a dizzying web of accounts shows just how complicated some of these money trails became. Based on what SBF says, customer deposits were routed to FTX in an admittedly poorly designed way. Rather than deposits directly landing in FTX's accounts, for years the company was instead processing deposits through Alameda's, where an internal FTX ledger would reflect those liabilities. For example, if a customer, let's call him Bob, deposited $100 to trade on FTX, an interim account of that deposit would be tracked in the fiat at ledger, as money Alameda owed to FTX. As SBF claims, there was a bug in the system that incorrectly displayed the totals on the fiat at ledger. He also alleges its very existence was hidden from him, only being able to see a separate account. 
After the bug in the accounting system was discovered, the $18 billion total in Alameda's displayed debt to FTX was changed and lowered to $10 billion. As SBF claims, because of that, he was unaware of the true potential for Alameda's financial collapse to take down FTX's platform. If the defense is able to show that SBF was not aware of certain things that were happening on the Alameda side that may have led to the collapse, that may have led to the idea of customers not being able to access funds, does that persuade against being found guilty? It might or might not, but if you're a member of a conspiracy, you're on the hook for the actions of the co-conspirators mm -hmm. as long as they're reasonably foreseeable. So if uh, you don't need to know everything that your co-conspirators are doing to be criminally liable for those actions, uh, but if you willing, willfully join a conspiracy uh, and actions are taken in furtherance of the conspiracy by others, until you withdraw um, unequivocally from the conspiracy, you're on the hook for it. And at the end of the day, uh, he's going to have to decide whether he's going to testify to try to refute what probably three witnesses at, at minimum, plus a whole bunch of pure fact witnesses, are going to say about what he knew and when he knew it, and what he directed, what he said, what he authorized, etc. In cases like that, you know, Elizabeth Holmes may be a good example to look at as far as people testifying in their own defense. I mean, what are you expecting? Even the brightest criminal defendant tends to overestimate their capacity to wow the jury and outthink the prosecution. In general, uh, defense lawyers don't like their, their clients to testify. There are exceptions to every rule. And ultimately, it's not a decision of the lawyer, it's a decision of the client. There's no flaw in claiming that you didn't know something. Uh -huh. The problem is to assert that, one, he's gonna to have to testify, because nobody else is gonna be able to assert that for him. So that's gonna subject him to about three days of cross-examination. Second, um, there's gonna be more than one witness, I expect, who's gonna say, actually, he did know, and here's how he knew. Uh, third, there may or may not be documents to support that. Mm -hmm. um, fourth, I'm not sure how much this ties into the computer code, but what's alleged in the indictment is that he directed uh, that the computer code be altered to allow certain transactions to occur. And fifth, as, as the owner and, and uh, having as much at stake as he did, is it really credible to believe that he didn't have his finger on the pulse and was somehow unaware of multi-billion dollar hole. That would be the response. But I assume, and it's just an assumption, that at least one and probably at least two of the co-conspirators are gonna testify that he knew, and again, you have to focus on the period of time. Your question, and maybe his defense, is focused on the collapse and what happened and what he knew when it collapsed. He's not charged with the collapse of FTX. He's charged with a whole bunch of things that led up to the collapse of FTX. So you have the prosecution coming out and including the collapse in the indictment to bring these charges against SBF. Why do that? It was probably done for a couple of reasons. One is to complete the story. It does in some ways make it a more compelling story because you have, according to the government, a catalog of fraud and deception that winds up with a collapse. But and a lot of people have, But you getting, wouldn't have done it because it opens the door to a potential who did what in the collapse. I'm not, you know, I'm not willing to say I wouldn't have done it. Yeah. Uh, but I would have been at least sensitive to the fact that it could open those doors to arguments and evidence about who's really to blame for the ultimate collapse yes. that wouldn't be there if you didn't reference the collapse in the indictment. So that's part of the reason why you'll see in the indictment these are charged in pairs of conspiracy and then the substantive offense. It's easier for the government to prove the conspiracy than the substantive offense. Hmm. 
substantive offense being wire fraud, securities fraud, the conspiracy charge being conspiracy to commit wire fraud, conspiracy to commit securities fraud. To be uh, guilty of a conspiracy, you have to um, knowingly, I think willfully, join at least one other person um, with an objective of violating uh, a United States law. And what's important for the criminal case is what's charged in the indictment, uh -huh. what's necessary for the government to prove in terms of the elements of the offenses charged. The defense will try to create, I'll call it, sideshows um, and maybe make it about the bankruptcy, make it about the collapse, but that's not really what's fundamentally charged. And the judge's job is to keep the jury focused on what's relevant to what's charged and limit uh, the amount of smoke and sideshow. Clearly, there are still a lot of unanswered questions surrounding FTX's collapse, but there are only so many we can ask in an interview. Our NFT holders are already deciding which questions to ask, and if an interview with SBF is still possible, coinage will start there. Next week, we'll continue to dig into the other critical elements we expect to see at SBF's trial. You can join in our inquisition for answers and co-own our project at coinage.media. As always, stay safe out there.